And uh, here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you this morning about wholeness, uh, but I just want to tell you, I, I'm not like a, I'm not a guru. I, I, I think that's the first thing I need you to know up front. Like, I'm not a guru. I'm not a, um, uh, I'm not a monk. I'm not a, I'm not a holy man. Uh, I don't have trade secrets. You know what I mean? So I'm going to share with you some things that, that I've come to know in my own life. And I, hopefully they're, they're beneficial to you as well. And so I want to talk about wholeness, but maybe from sort of a, the side door rather than the front door. Is, is that okay? Yeah. So I, I really just want to look at about three verses this morning. And we're just going to sort of unpack those and then unpack them again. I, I really don't want to look at anything more than that. And uh, the only text that I have for us this morning is out of Genesis. And it is chapter 1. And if you want to open up your Bibles, there you can. We're going to look at three verses. This is Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at 26, 27, and 28. Just these three verses, and I'm going to read to you out of the New Living Translation. It's been the Bible I've been carrying around lately. It says this, and you, you've heard this before. It says, Then God said, let us make human beings in our image so they can be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Rain over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. That's the only thing I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about being a whole person. And I think the beginning of being a whole person I think the beginning of being a whole person is waking up to the fact that you and I have been made in the image of God. And so that's really what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about what it means to be uh, someone who is in some way reflecting the image of God back into the world. And this is no small thing because apparently, at least from what we can tell from the scripture and then even from like some of the, some of the sciences that are available to us uh, in the modern world, apparently human beings are, are the only creatures that have some really unique properties and we're going to talk about some of those here in a moment. But of everything that God makes, the one thing that he says that was made in his image were, were people. And so to be made in the image of God um, it, it is, is at the heart of what it means to, to possibly live a whole life. Like you couldn't, you couldn't live a whole life without waking up to your imageness. And you, couldn't, you can't step into wholeness without beginning to not just wake up to it, but, but, but walk in your imageness, if we can put it that way. So we have to discover, well, what does it even mean to be made in the image of God? Well, it means a lot of things, but the first thing I want to focus on this morning is one, one idea from the text, and we're going to look at this one idea, and then we're just going to kind of see where it goes for a little while. All right, so if we're made in the image of God, I guess the next question that's sort of being begged is this. It's, it's the question of, well, what is God like? So one way to begin to understand the image of God that he has sown into human beings is to begin to wrestle with the question of, what is God like? Who, who is he? What is, what is his nature? And, and by the way, there are hints of what God is like in the text that I just read you this morning. Um, by the way, that three little verses I read you, really peculiar vo verses, really strange verses. Um, sometimes we've grown up in the church, um, maybe you were like me, you grew up in the church, and you read these verses, and they're just verses, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, you know, he made things, and it's good. But we, we miss some of the weirdness that's there. And, and there are some really strange things that are happening in this little piece of Scripture. If, if you read it slowly, it should cause all sorts of questions to emerge. All right, without being too forensic, I, I want you to notice the pronouns. Did you guys notice the pronouns that we were reading in the verses this morning? Did you notice that in verse 26, all the pronouns that relate to God are plural? Did you notice that? Let us make man in our image, right? But then look at verse 27, the very next verse. 
Are the pronouns that relate to God, are they plural or are they singular? Isn't that weird? Like, was the Bible writer, like, was, was, he, was he drunk? You know, did, did something get lost in translation? Yeah. Well, I don't think that whoever wrote that passage was drunk, and I don't think something got lost in translation. I think this is, I think this is a Bible way of sort of tipping the hand at us towards answering that question of what is God like? So in 26, all the pronouns are plural. In 27, all the pronouns are singular. And so we come into this dynamic of God is himself plural and singular. It's a really weird idea. It's that idea in the church that you've heard of and that I've heard of for so many years. It's the idea that God is a trinity, right? He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he's one. And it's intellectually almost beyond our grasp. Um, in fact, almost every single time I hear somebody talk about the Trinity, um, their explanations are kind of horrible, aren't they? You know, if you ever read, even like really smart people, when they begin to talk about the Trinity, it either gets so stupid it can't be God, or it gets so transcendent you're convinced that even the person who's speaking doesn't know what they're talking about. It seems like we go one of those two directions. But yeah, I think this is part of what it means for us to reflect the image of God. It's that you and I are a plurality and a singularity all at the same time. Now, God is plural and he's singular. Yeah, the opening verses of, um, the opening verses of Genesis also show us the very same thing. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 and 3, we get Father, Son, and Spirit as well. Because it says in those opening verses that, well, God created and, and, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters, right? And then, and then we get this, this little moment that God spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light. And we know from like some New Testament stuff, like the opening chapter of the Gospel of John, that the Word was with God and the Word was God. And we know that John was talking about Jesus. And so Jesus is the Word of God. And so even at the beginning of Genesis, those first three verses you get the trinity. You get the plurality and the singularity of God creating the cosmos. And so what does it mean to be a person who reflects the divine image? What does it mean to be an image bearer? And what is God like? Well, the opening chapters of Genesis really highlight this weird thing about God. He is plural and he is singular. And so if we're going to live whole lives, we need to wake up to the unique ways in which we are plural, and the weak, unique ways that we're singular. And um, this is what we're going to look at just for a few minutes here. Um, in fact, we need to talk through this dynamic just a little bit. Um, here's what I mean by talk through it. Okay, God's a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And at the same time, God is whole. We all agree, right? God is completely whole. He's a trinity, and at the same time, he's whole. And then the other thing that Genesis is showing us in those opening chapters is that God is life. Like there is no life apart from him. He's the one who, who has spoken and sown life into the cosmos. So we get, we get these really three distinct facts highlighted to us in the opening chapters of the Bible. Uh, God is a trinity, yet God is singular and he is whole, and God is life. And we need to sort of like hold all three of those ideas in our mind because here's basically what that means. It means that God is relational. God is relational. And if God is relational, then life is relational. And if God is whole, then wholeness will be rooted in properly relating. Does that make sense? I mean, I just want to go over that again because this is kind of a really big deal for us going forward. God's a trinity, God's whole, God is life. And if God is relational then life is relational, and if life is relational, then wholeness will be rooted in properly relating. That's what it means. And then you begin to ask the question, well, relating to who? Or relating to what? Well, let's think of it this way. Um, having a real life, having a real life or having a whole life is probably going to be relational in some deeply profound way. That's what it means. Have you ever noticed that to the degree that you or I become fractured, it's 
almost always, like 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a relational fracture. Right? So life. God is, God is a happy community within himself. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. He is one. The author of life. He is always relating to himself in perfect harmony. And so wholeness is going to be rooted deeply in how we relate. How we relate. Okay, and here's what's really, really interesting. Um, we're living in this world now that actually excels at complicating, dissolving, and then breaking us relationally. Uh, not only that, but more and more of our interactions are being mediated through technology. And by the way, we have not yet begun to think deeply enough about the implications of what it means to be relating creatures who now relate via technology in such a profound way. Well, let me just, we'll put a little pause here for a second. Um, by the way, I, I have an iPad Pro up here. I've got, a, got one of these little, you know, it's my precious. <laughs> like, I'm in, okay? So there's, there's zero guilt in what I'm about to say. Like, I, we're in, I'm not letting it up, you know. But we haven't thought deeply enough about what all of this means yet. Because for millennia, and depending on how you, you know, do the, the chart line for how long people have been on the earth, and I'm really not interested in having that conversation this morning, but depending on how you do that, uh, whether you're young earth or whether you're an evolutionary person, the one thing we can agree on is people have been here a really long time. We've been here a really, really long time. And in like the last 25 years, the way that human beings are human radically changed, Right? And so our relating took, a, a, took a, like an exponential shift, and it is mediated through technology. And we just have not thought deeply enough about what that means just yet. You know, I, I'm an early adopter, and I'm an early adopter, but the fact that we have just, we just exploded into this new thing, wow, something is definitely up. And you know what? We all know it. We, uh, we don't, we're not always able to articulate it, but we all know it. We feel it. We can feel there's something that's moving. In fact, um, the other day, I was um, reading. Uh, I was reading a new book, and it's it's by a New York Times author. His name is uh, Sebastian Younger. He's like a war reporter for the Times. And he just finished this book called Tribe, and and I'll just without talking about the book all morning, I'll just tell you sort of the thesis of the book. Here, here's the thesis of the book. Basically, human beings would rather endure war. Famine and um, uh, the worst conditions of life together than to be prosperous alone, right? And his opening chapters are just fascinating, and he just walks through the early frontier of America. And the early frontier of America, he talks about how uh, in white colonial prosperous society that showed up and began to, you know, build all the places that we have now, uh, white prosperous colonial society often had people who defected and left civilization to go live with the Indian tribes on the borders of the frontiers. And anytime someone went to live with the Indians, they never came back. And the Indian tribes never came into proper colonial culture. And, and basically, he opens up with this image and all of these stories. And he says, why? Why? Because, because something in our relating and in our togetherness in modern society is, is foundationally broken. And we all know it, and at this point, we're unable to accurately articulate it, but there is no sense of tribe anymore. What is it? It is, it, there's something in our plurality that is not enriching our singularity, you know? Or to say it another way, there's something in, in, our, in our individuality that is, that is not living in the plurality, and it is, it is fracturing us at a soul level. It's amazing. So back to this other idea from the scripture. Well, whatever wholeness is, wholeness must be rooted in a kind of existence that enriches us relationally and surrounds us and then weaves us in. So rather than robbing from us or isolating us or making us more independent, we're made to be woven in. And so for the first time in human history, pretty much all of us live independent, almost solitary, sol solitary lives. Uh, you and I live right now the way that kings lived before, right? So we, we've, all been, we've all become the sort of people who are financially independent. Uh, everybody has their own house. Everybody in the house has their own room. Uh, everyone in the house has their own 
this, their own that, their own that. You know. Even within families, there's very little sharing, right? So we've become more independent. We've become more, quote, hashtag blessed. Uh, but at, at the, we haven't considered yet at the expense of what, right? Uh, so we've, we've got to enter into this. And so blessing, as, at least as the way America has defined blessing, blessing makes us more alone rather than more together. And makes us more independent rather than more interdependent. Okay. Before we think about societal change, we actually probably need to go more basic. And we need to think about our own lives. And we need to think again about what it means to be made in the image of God. Um, I guess you probably already realize where I'm going with this. But here's what I wanted to talk about for a minute. Uh, not only is God a trinity, but you're a trinity. Right? And if you're going to be a whole person, you need to become awake and aware to the fact that God is not just a trinity, but you're a trinity. That's what I've been trying to say all morning. That if we've been made in the divine image of a person who is plural and singular, we need to wake up to the fact that you are plural and you are singular. Right? God is a trinity and you're a trinity. You might be thinking, well, how am I a trinity? Well, you're a body, a soul, and a spirit. And so to live into wholeness is to become more aware of your bodiness, your soulness, and your spiritness, and to give attention to each of those things. Yeah, your body, your soul, and your spirit. And we should probably define those parts here real quick. And by the way, I just want to say that as I define these things, I know that my definitions are going to be profoundly unsatisfactory. Okay? So if you're a philosophy major, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> because as soon as you try to begin to define soul and body and spirit, uh, you can easily fall into the abyss of philosophy and then just never return. But for the purposes of this morning, what, and by the way, I like philosophy, but for the purposes of this morning, I would just want to offer you some really crude definitions that maybe we could handle. Is that okay? All right. What is your body? Well, your body is your blood, and your body is your brain, your nerves, and your endocrine system. I think we're on, am I, any doctors here? I think I'm on level ground. Where's my sister-in-law when I need it, right? Yeah, it's like, it's you. It's the stuff you can touch. And then there's your soul. And then what is your soul? Well, your soul is your intellect. It's your emotions. It's your capacity to dream and hope. That's another part that we never talk about enough. It's your capacity to dream and hope. It's your capacity to conceive of the future. You know, that's one of the things that separates human beings from almost all the other animals. We conceive of the future. We will sacrifice the present for a better future. Other animals don't do that. And that's your soul. Uh, not only that, but it's, um, if we put all this together, it's what we might say is it's consciousness. It's the fact that you and I are aware that we're having an experience. Uh, human beings have this really weird capacity to know that we're here and that we're having an experience called life. And um, I don't know if you've ever read any philosophy about consciousness, but it is, it is unbelievable. And here's what's amazing. Um, no part of modern neurology or neuroscience or philosophy has yet been able to hammer down exactly what is consciousness. It's fascinating. It's the weirdest thing. We could, like, we could just spend a few minutes thinking about consciousness together and we'd all be like, you know? Your cute little dog at home, he's, he's completely unaware that he's a dog and he's just like, <laughs> but you're not, you know? Like you're here and you know you're here and you're thinking about the future and, and you're, you're aware of the ways in which, you know, hopefully you're aware of the ways in which you are affecting the room and the atmosphere and other people and we're connected and what is that? It's consciousness. It's consciousness. Um, it's, a, a, it's, it's your ability to know that you're a person. Uh, it's that fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're having a human experience. Yeah. And then there's your spirit. And what's your spirit? Well, your spirit is your life. Like your actual, your actual life. It's the thing that animates you so that you're not just like some meat in the floor. You know? Um, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament word for spirit. And this is really cool. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word for spirit is the word for, like, breath or wind. It's like Barak in the Old Testament, and it's pneuma in the New Testament. And it's interesting that both the Greek and the Hebrew, they agree that whatever spirit is, it's like breath. It's like wind. Uh, it's the fact that you're a breathing person right now, you know? Not just, a, not, just a, not just a thinking person, but there's something in here that's animated all of that. It's like the thing that is energizing your ability to do any of that. 
You know, it's, um, it's, it's the breathing, the in and out. It's the breath that you're aware of, but it's even more importantly, the breath that you're not aware of, you know? Here's the other thing about all of these things. I hope you understand that there's all kinds of overlap, right? Like, have you ever thought about this? Where does your mind begin and your brain end? Or maybe I said that wrong. Where does your brain end and your mind begin? How? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah, uh, your, your spirit, your life, and your breath. How many of you understand that that's deeply connected to your lungs? Right? You can't even experience your own spirit without like, also beginning to experience your body. Yeah. And your brain is responsible for all your autonomous body functions that you never think about. Like, you've never thought consciously one day in your life, heartbeat, heartbeat. It's happening at the subconscious level. Right? It's amazing. So there's all this overlap. You're a trinity. You have really distinct parts. But you're such a unity that there's profound overlap. And in the places that they overlap, we can't even parse that out. We can get down to a certain level and then we just we begin to lose. It gets grainy. We don't know where it goes, right? Now, this is really important. And here's why this is really important. Because what that means is that all of these things are related. Uh, there's that word again, right? Relational. What is real life? Well, real life is relational. And so your body, your soul, and the spirit, they're all related. And what that means is if you're alive... Uh, you're functioning at some very basic relational level, at least within your own person, you know? And it might just be survival, but at least you're here. But what we want to do is we want to move past survival, and we want to move past numbness, and we want to live into thriving presence. And so one of the places we have to begin is by considering the relational human complexity that makes up your own being. So if we're going to be whole people, uh, you just need to consider again your whole being. Because mm. here's the thing, everybody in here, the thing that I know that about you, because I know it's about me too, the thing we're all hungering for is integration. You know, we're, we're, we're hungering for wholeness. We're hungering for everything to come together. We're hungering for, for unity. And that's another way to think about your life. Um, the spiritual path is the path towards increasing integration. The spiritual path is the path towards increasing oneness and, and unity. And so if you're, going to, if you're going to more deeply reflect the, the image of God or maybe more clearly reflect the image of God, it'd be good and right to do some reflection about your own life and then give some energy to caring for the wonderful trinity that makes you you. That's what it means to be a whole person. Okay, let's talk about our bodies for a moment. at least within the church, too much of wholeness talk pays too little attention to the body. Way, way too little attention to the body. And the irony here is that our culture is so, so body conscious in a really unhealthy way. So what I want to talk about just for a second here is I want to talk about considering your body, and, but I, I first need to tell you what I'm not talking about here. I'm not talking about becoming a model. Okay, And I'm not talking about becoming an Instagram beautiful person. right? Um, so much of that is just shallowness, hoping for depth. But what I am talking about is that wholeness has to consider the fact that we're physical beings and that our physicality needs cared for. You, you can't be a whole person and then neglect your body. You need to care for your body in a deep and a profound way. And so, what does that mean? Well, that means we, we probably ought to consider uh, what we eat and how much we move. Now, as soon as I say those two things, like a zillion pounds of guilt just comes into the room, right? I just said, consider how we eat and how much we move at church. And it's like, guilt. No. Okay, let's kick that out, you know? That's not what I'm talking about. But here's what I mean. Uh, for thousands of years, human beings placed great demands on their physical body just to survive, you know? Like, you'd have to hunt food, or you'd have to, you'd have to farm, or you, you know, it was, everything about life was physically demanding. 
And so part of what it means to be a human is, oh, deep inside of our DNA is just this, wow, your ancestors were all beasts or you wouldn't be here, right? But now we live in a modern world where, well, you don't have to farm and uh, you don't have to hunt and you don't have to gather. And by the way, I'm glad there's like grocery stores and I love Kroger. Like we all, we all do that, right? I'm from Kentucky. We have Kroger. I don't know what you guys have here. Yeah, you got Kroger. Okay. But, but now we live in a world where you don't have to have those demands placed upon your physicality. And so there is, there's a regression in our physicality. Not only that, but one of the things we have to understand as well is that for thousands of years, life was really hard, and now it's not in the same way. Life is still hard, but it's not hard in the same way. For thousands of years, life was hard physically, and so we have a structure that was made to do difficult things, and now there's almost hardly ever anything difficult to do unless you choose it, right? And so what does wholeness mean? Wholeness means that inside of your DNA, all of your ancestors were beasts. All of them were beasts, or you wouldn't be here. And wholeness means probably making difficult choices about doing difficult things with your body so that you can enter into a new kind of wholeness. Because the truth is, there is a certain kind of satisfaction that will never come from the soul or from the spirit. It can only come from the physical nature of your own body. Just, let's just change this conversation slightly. Uh, how many of you have ever done like a really hard day's work around your house or in your garden or in your yard and at the end you were just like so tired and on the but you had this like yes you're satisfied right isn't that weird and then we don't pay attention to it do we we're like we just get up you know it's like Saturday was great like you busted your tail you sweat you stink you made things you brought order to the chaos that would be like Genesis 1, 1 through 3. That's, what, that's really what we're here to do. We're, we're here to interject order in, back into chaos, you know, to, to live a plural, unified life, to bring something new out of the, out of the ground. And, and it's weird how when you do that, when you enact that, all of a sudden there's this deep satisfaction. Like you'll wake up the next morning, you'll be, you'll be so sore, and you'll be really happy. Isn't that weird? Like it changes your emotions. I think some of that also just has to do with like being outside and like getting some flipping vitamin D, you know, like, yeah, we're physical beings. Uh, We were made to move. And here's what I've noticed, that the more sedentary we become, the more relationally broken we become at an individual level. The more sedentary we become, the more relationally broken we will be at an individual level. And here's what I mean. Uh, uh, Because if you're alive... You're relationally united in your trinity, at least to the level of survival. And what that means is that everything affects everything. Uh, This is why depressed people want to sleep in bed all day. Right? Depression in the soul eventually expresses itself in the body as fatigue and lack of energy. So every part of you is affecting every part of you. And to enter into wholeness at the body level will also touch wholeness at the spirit and the soul level. It's why if you move your body and if you do anything challenging physically, there'll be, there'll be an emotional bump that comes from it. Because on the inside, you just, you, you, did the, you did the thing you were made to do, you know? I'll tell you, let me tell you a story. Um, several years ago, this is probably six years ago, five or six years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were in Chicago together, which is, that's kind of like our date city. It's about six hours away from us. So if we, if we get the kids to the grandparents for a little while, uh, unless we have something else to do, we might just go to Chicago because it's like a quick car drive or it's like a $10 airplane ride from Louisville. You know, it's like, so we'll just go there. And this was about six years ago, and um, it is the most perfect October weekend in Chicago. Chicago is an October city. That's where I mean, it's like literally where you want to go. It's like it's like New York or something. It's just perfect. Like every the weather, it's not hot, it's not cold, it's just great. And we were there, and we were sitting in this corner cafe, and um, there were there were all these people everywhere, and and I ordered us a nice bottle of wine, and we're just holding hands, and we're just we're just having the best time, right? And there's no kids around, and it's just awesome. Um, and we're we're sitting there, and we're we're talking about our lives, and then. 
then we do that thing that, you know, that you can do when you're a married couple where you can just be together and nobody has to say anything and that's okay too, which I like that sometimes. And so I'm just sipping on my wine and we're just people watching. We're not, we're not talking. And then all of a sudden this horrible thought comes into my brain. It's a thought that I'd had before, but I never felt the gravity. And the thought was this. Are, are all these people going to hell? Like all of them? And then the thought got worse. Well, if all these people are going to hell, then probably 90% or 95% of the people who have ever lived are going to hell. And like only 5% are going to make it. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to think about this now. I, I am having a great time with my wife. I just, and I tried to just do that wipe thing. You know, it's like, not thinking. You know, not today, devil. You know, it's just, and as soon as I pushed it away, like, it just came right back. And it came back with more force this time. And I'm in this perfect moment, and I just start having the worst thoughts. And then associated with the worst thoughts are the, are the worst feelings, right? And then I hear this voice inside my head go, don't tell your wife, <laughs> you know? <laughs> don't tell your wife. And then 30 seconds later, I'm like, hey, babe, you think all these people are going to hell? <laughs> Fast forward. We get home. I'm not a depressed person. That's not who I am. I have other issues. I could tell you about them later. But I get home and I am, I'm depressed. And I'm and I'm pastoring a church. And I stop sleeping. I can't sleep. This goes on for two and a half years. Hardly slept for two and a half years. Um, I am overcome with existential pain. And I'm preaching every Sunday morning to my church. And I'm pretty sure that if there is a God, he's a terrible person. I'm pretty sure that he's just rigged this system somehow that 5% are getting in. 95% are not getting in. And there's nothing anyone can really do about it. Like, you know, I mean, Billy Graham comes and he gets a stadium of 50,000 people. But that literally means nothing. Cosmotically, it means nothing. It's like, who cares, you know? And I am just dying. I'm dying on the inside. It is the worst thing ever. And why am I telling you that story right now? I'm telling you that story because there's probably some people here who've had these same thoughts, and you thought, oh, those are illegal thoughts. They're not illegal thoughts. I just want you to know that. Anyway, so I just, I was dying for two and a half years. I was getting more depressed. Uh, Who I am was changing in in not a great way. Uh, I talked to all the right people. Didn't help. I read all the right books, didn't help. And then I just started doing something different. Turned 35. and went, uh, I'm 39 now. So I turned 35, and I just woke up one day, and I was like, man, not only am I depressed, but I feel weak. I, I had been out playing basketball with my kids the day before, and I'm like, I feel weak. I'm like sore, and these kids are kicking my tail. So I just started feeling old or whatever. I don't even know what it was. So I, I was like, I just got to go to the gym. I'm going to the gym, you know. So I started going to the gym. I never went to the gym. I just always ran around and did my thing. I started going to the gym. Then I, and by the way, all this is happening at the level of accident, you know. I'm not, I'm not trying to fix myself. Uh, it's just, just one of those deals where God is helping you and you didn't know it, right? So I just started going to the gym, and then then I did this other weird thing where I, I basically, I, I was praying, but I, I, I stopped praying. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you what that means. Um, I, couldn't even, I couldn't even address God anymore. I, I just wasn't even sure I wanted to talk to him. But I liked Jesus. It was funny. Like, this time I was like, I still like Jesus. I don't, you know, I don't know about the others, if there is another, but if I, Jesus guy, I'm pretty sure. And so I just started doing this thing, and I didn't even know what I, what I call it now is I call it sitting with Jesus. And so I would just, I would think about Jesus, and I would sit there, and I wouldn't say a word for like 10 minutes a day. I would just do this. I didn't pray. I didn't pray for people. I didn't pray for my church. I didn't pray for myself. But I just would think about Jesus, and I would kind of like try to just sit with him, hoping that he's real and that he could be with me, you know? All right, did that. And... Um, I did a few other things, but all of a sudden, I was doing these two things in particular for a while. And here's what I noticed. I started getting happier. I started getting happier. Then one day, I got a breakthrough, a massive, massive breakthrough. 
And it came while I was sinning with Jesus, right? Um, after working out for about a year and a half, and after six months of not praying, praying, sitting with Jesus, uh, one day, the Holy Spirit came into my room, and I knew who it was. You know, it's just that feeling. You ever, like, been in a room or in a car, and you're alone, and there's just, you're just very aware that you're not the only person there? I just became very aware that I was not alone. And I heard, I heard, on, in, I think it was internal, I heard, I heard Jesus ask me a question. He said, hey, do you want to talk? I said, I do not want to talk. He says, yeah, I think you do want to talk. And I knew what, I knew what God was talking to me about. He's like, you know that thing that you've been really upset about? I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm like, I can't even sleep anymore, right? He says, I want to talk to you about that. I said, okay, what do you want to say? And Jesus says, you know that, the problem is you think you're more merciful than me. And then he left the room. Here's what's weird. After that happened, all the heaviness left. All the heaviness left. I don't really have any more answers about how things work out or who's in or who's out or anything else than I used to. I mean, we can talk about that. But nobody really knows how any of that works. We just know that there's something working. But here's what I do know. I know that Jesus came and sat with me, and he affirmed to me that I am not more merciful than him, and that feels great, right? So for almost three years, I was really afraid that I was the one who had out-trumped God in mercy. You know. All right, why did I tell you that story? Well, here, here's why. Because, because you and I are whole people. And, and if we have pain in our souls, then we might need to attend to the other parts of our life so that we can begin to work some of that pain out and then create space for God to come and do his thing, right? So I, I just went to the gym and I started working out. And here's what I found out about my own life and about my own uh, pastoring and um, just the work that I do, but it, it's similar to the things that you guys do too. I, I found that sometimes if I don't know how to let go of uh, pain or angst or, or whatever you want to call it, emotion in my soul, I've, no, I've noticed that a lot of times that to simply move my body gives that energy someplace to go. And here's what I've come to believe. I believe after a year and a half of working out and beginning to attend to my body, I believe I, I got healthier. And somehow, that coupled with a new prayer practice, it made space for God to come and say something to me. You know? I was giving, or let me put it this way. Maybe this is slightly less mystical. <laughs> I think sometimes to attend to the body can, can hold the soul until God can come and speak. Does that work for you? Yeah. So what does this mean to be a whole person? Well, I think one of the things this means to be a whole person is th that we need to carefully consider the fact that you were given a physical body and you are not a ball of, of intelligent gas floating in the ether. Right? Yeah. yeah. What does wholeness mean? It means attending to that. So here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you guys. Move your body. You know what? And, and get some kind of a routine. And do something that's moderately challenging. And you don't have to kill yourself. You do not have to kill yourself. Uh, you don't have to get abs. But your soul and your spirit need your body to sweat occasionally. And not just from anxiety. You know? Take up walking. Try yoga. Go to CrossFit. Lift some weights. Mountain bike. Swim. Anything physical. Garden. Play with the kids. Do something that you prioritize and pay for it. Yeah. And then beyond that, occasionally do something really difficult. Occasionally do something really hard. Because human beings need challenge. You were made for challenge. All of our ancestors were challenged. And so we need to learn to accept challenge in one area of your life. And here's what I've noticed. I've noticed that saying yes to challenge in one area of my life increases my capacity to deal with challenge in other areas of my life. Why? Because you're a plurality that's whole. Yeah. You, you won't just become stronger physically and not at the same time become stronger emotionally and spiritually. I know this sounds weird, but it is absolutely the truth. You know? 
Some of us have really, really broken families, and we've become extremely wounded in the soul. Here's what's weird. You go, you go to therapy, and your blood pressure will go down. Why? Because when the soul becomes healthy, the body will respond. Like some of us are carrying around years of like arthritis and rheumatoid and, and inflammation, and it literally has nothing to do with your physical body. It's like pain lodged in the soul. Mm, yeah. So, talk about your soul for a minute. Oh, there's so much here. Um, what is your soul? Well, it, it's all that stuff we were talking about, like consciousness. But how do we, how do we begin to maybe benefit our soul? Now, here's the number one thing I would say. Expose yourself to anything that's beautiful. You know? You, you want to feed your soul? Feeding your soul is mostly about nourishing yourself with anything that's beautiful. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's highly individual, right? Because what, what feeds you and what you find to be like compelling and beautiful and, and moving is sometimes different than what I find to be compelling, moving, and, and beautiful. But I, I want you to really, really consider that. Like the world is amazing. The world, the world is fascinating and it's amazing. And you can find anything you're looking for. And if you go looking for beauty, you will find it. And beauty, man, beauty changes the human heart. Like nothing else I know. Like nothing else I know. This is why like um, in the vineyard, but not just in the vineyard, like in church, this is why Christians have for so long sung songs about the Son of God, you know? Um, it, it's not enough to just say it. Sometimes there are certain things we just have, we have to sing it. And to sing it, uh, it is one way of exposing ourselves to the beautiful, you know? I mean, that's actually why we sing. Now, s songs are always overflow. So when, when saying it and shouting it isn't enough, you'll sing, whatever it is, whether it's pain or whether it's uh, joy, right? Um, and then some things are too big. So for instance, like uh, Jesus, the Son of God, you know, 100% God, 100% man, incarnation. That's actually an idea that no one can explain, and the only appropriate container for that idea is music and a song. And so uh, to expose ourselves to those things and to expose ourselves to beauty, it powerfully forms the heart. It powerfully forms the soul. Yeah. So feeding your soul is, is your ability to have a deeper life. You know, one of the things that, that I believe you want, and I know that's something I want, is that we want to be deep people. I don't think anybody here is hoping to be a shallow person. Right? You ever meet somebody who's just really shallow? Especially when they're a little bit older, it's really off-putting, isn't it? It's so sad, right? Here's the thing. You can be a deep person. And, and you don't have to be a deep person by trying to be serious. In fact, being a deep person is, is not serious all the way, you know? Uh, here's the other thing I've noticed. Uh, serious is not a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Uh, so it's not about that. It's not about that. It's something else, you know? But, but deep people, deep people have joy. But, but deep people can see the beauty in life, you know? Um, a fat soul is one that's, that's aware of... Uh, uh, aware of life at a very deep level. And the only way to really communicate and experience that is, you know, for me, it's like it's in the area of, of art. And I mean art in the broadest sense. I mean it in the sense that in some underlying unifying theme to this whole drama. I mean, like, I guess that's what I mean. I mean, like, if we're going to be deep people, uh, we need to begin to lean into uh, the artistic side of who you are. You know, and that doesn't mean that you'll have to become painters or photographers. I mean, it becomes you're the the sort of person that is aware that there is a unifying theme to this whole thing. Uh, by the way, that's what makes something beautiful, is when you stumble into the fact that it has meaning, and that it is communicating something beyond itself, and it ties into the big narrative. You know, the big capital N, that's up there. You know, and and this happens all the time. Uh, you could you could go to an art museum. You could go to a show. You could. Uh, listen to a great record. All of these things feed your soul. But then the point of all those things is to begin to teach you how to recognize these themes in your normal life. You know? Like when you begin to see the, the beauty in your family and in the person and in your church and in your community and when you see how everything that everyone is and all the things that people do are tying into a bigger narrative, even if we're unconscious of the narrative, like people are always reflecting something more, that's always what beauty is. That's where beauty comes from. It's the harmony that we're fitting inside of a story. Does this make sense? Yeah, this is how you feed your soul. Become aware that your life is important 
And it's a, it's a line or two in a much, much longer story. And it, and it really matters. That's what deep people do. Well, how do you do that? Well, here's just some really practical things that are not going to surprise you. Uh, read a book. <laughs> read a book. And especially read a book that's not for information. Read a, read a book to just be knocked over. Okay, I'll tell you my favorite book. I read it every year. Um, who here has ever read the book, A River Runs Through It? It's 100 pages. It has no chapters. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a perfect book. It's a perfect book. Here's, the, here's what's awesome about A River Runs Through It. The first 10 pages in A River Runs Through It, um, he's mixing two metaphors. Anytime Norman MacLean in the first 10 pages talks about reformed theology, he's really talking about fly fishing. And anytime he talks about fly fishing, he's really talking about reformed theology. And after 10 pages, you will weep because it's so right. Yeah. And then at the end of the book, at the end of the book, oh, I won't tell you what happens. But at the end of the book, he basically begins to raise the biggest question in life, which is, how do you love someone who's free? Right? How do you really love someone who has the ability to not be loved? Or to, or to hold your love at arm's distance? That's really the question of the book. And it is heartbreaking. And it is wonderful. Why? Because every single one of us are eventually going to meet the person who is going to be difficult to love and hold our love at arm's distance, right? And then you realize, oh, all the times that I was doing that, it wasn't just my own little tiny miserable life, that that experience of trying to love someone who would hold me at arm's distance, that's in the big end narrative. It's in the big one. That's like a, that's a universal truth. How do you love someone who's free? That's not something small. That's something huge. And then what happens? Your soul expands. Read a book. Go look at some art, especially some art that you do not understand. Become mystified. Stand in front of something that fills you with only questions and no answers. Why? Because life is filled with questions that have no answers, right? Be become mystified for a change. Like, leave the practical for a moment. Uh, step into things that are profoundly non-useful. I love this. I mean, think about this for a moment. Uh, okay, so God created the heavens and the earth. And we, we just don't even think about what that means. I mean, for one, uh, how many of us understand here that God has uh, no needs, he has only wants? That's an amazing idea. So God is a whole person. So if God is himself whole, that means he has no needs. God doesn't need anything. He didn't need you. He doesn't, he doesn't currently need you. And if he doesn't need you, that means only one thing. It means he wants you. And that's really different. I would rather be, I would, I, I would rather, I, I want to be wanted. I do not necessarily want to be needed as much as I want to be wanted. That's like way more powerful. But then it goes even, it gets more absurd, right? It gets profoundly more absurd because there's things in the universe that make no sense. That, like, why is Pluto there? You know, is it a planet? Is it not a planet? <laughs> we don't know. No one knows, you know? But then we ask the question, well, why does it exist? Because he wanted it. That is, the, the, the only existential answer for why Pluto exists is because God wanted it. It, it serves no purpose. It does not hold our solar system together. It is held together by something. It doesn't hold anything together. Yeah. Go look at some art. Be mystified. Be baptized into the absurd. Stand in front of things that you have no answers for. It will cause your soul to expand. It will allow you to become more flexible about the own is your issues that make no sense and the family members who drive you crazy and make no sense. I know you think I'm crazy. I'm, I'm, literally, I'm, I'm literally this medieval. That's how medieval I am. I believe this, you know? Read books, see art. Go to a show. Like, go to a show. What is that? Like, I don't know. Go to a show. Like, some of you are Broadway people. You know, go to Broadway. Let somebody sing to you the grand narrative of life. Go to a really great rock show and let somebody sing to you all of their pain and find out that you're not alone because you feel the same way. You know, let somebody sing to you all of your joy. Let it happen. Just go stand in it. Be bowled over. And here's the great thing about a rock show. Um, I'm, I believe in this too. Uh, the great thing about a rock show is that 
you will get assaulted with sound, which I love that, right? Yeah, and it becomes, it's where, it's where the emotions meet your body, and to even stand in the room, uh, your, your whole body is vibrating. It's, they're not just singing you a narrative, they're not just singing you a story, but the music is touching your body. It's like, whoa. Why are those moments so powerful and profound? That's why, because they're talking to you at more than just your intellect or your soul. It's, it's hitting your body as well, right? Yeah, come on, let's do this. Whatever makes you feel alive, encounter the wonder of life. Whatever causes you to weep, whatever causes your mind and your emotions to be moved. See, and in a world where so much is broken and ugly, we need exposure to the beautiful. Yeah, and I don't just mean superficial beauty. That's almost always propaganda. Superficial beauty is just trying to sell you something. I'm not talking about becoming more of a purchaser. I'm talking about something that no one can buy, like family and children and wonder and connection. Here's what feeds my soul. Uh, music, art, books, food, wine, and family. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever, like, have you ever made a list of things that like, feed your soul? Like, what makes you happy? Well, here's what makes me happy. To spend Saturday at home uh, work in my vineyard, uh, to have my sons help me. Working, so, uh, we, have a, we make wine, we have a vineyard, we make wine. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make me happy to work in my vineyard alone. It makes me happy to have my sons with me. Yeah, and to do something that matters. And then at the end of, like if we do this thing all summer, we harvest the grapes and then we make wine and then we put it on the table and we, there's something in the bottle that came from the soil, like right there, you know? And we did it, and it'll last for decades. Like once it's in the bottle, it's preserved. It's, it's, and by the way, that's, that's, a, that's, a, 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 that's a narrative in itself for the kingdom of heaven, you know? Uh, there's a reason Jesus turns water into wine. He takes the imperishable, and he makes it, he makes the, takes the perishable and the safe, and he turns it into something imperishable and dangerous. That's the kingdom of heaven right there. It's amazing. I love that. And so we just, you, again, you find those places where your story is tacking, tapping into the bigger story. Feeds your soul. Mm. Okay, your spirit. What's your spirit? That's your breath. Well, how, do you, uh, how do you attend to your spirit? Man, I'm going long. How do you attend to your spirit? Um, we'll just cut a bunch of this out. Here's how you attend to your spirit. <laughs> Are we okay? Are we okay? Because I don't want to take your whole Saturday. Okay. You have many more. <laughs> High fives. Okay, here's how you attend to your spirit. I'm just going to reduce this down to the main one, though. The main way you attend to your spirit is, in grati- is with gratitude, right? Because you didn't ask for your life. You didn't ask for your life. Your life wasn't your choice. No one chose to be born. No one chose their mother, their father, their time, their place in history. Uh, you were given a life. You were given a spirit. You were given breath. Uh, you didn't choose your breath. You didn't even accept your breath. This is the amazing thing. You, you, didn't even, you didn't even say yes to having your breath. It wasn't even a proposition. You just are. And, and you know what? Uh, we should be grateful. And so to, to, have, uh, to have any moment of gratitude in your daily routine is to attend to the Spirit. You know? Some of you were like, this sounds like yoga. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I don't know. It's your very life. It's, it's that you're an animated thinking body. And, 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 and so we, just, we can enter into our attending to our spirit with, with gratitude like nothing else. Um, the, the Bible says in Psalm 100 that we enter his gates with thanksgiving. We come into his presence with gratitude. You know? Gratitude is the door to his presence. And who is God? Oh, he's the breath. He's the great breath. <sighs> He's the breath that breathed and spoke this whole thing into being. And so to attend to, attend to gratitude, to, to attend to saying thank you for the thing that you didn't ask for, oh, man, it's, it's to attach your breath to that bigger heavenly breath. It's, that's what it is. And so you come into his presence. Why? Because it's life, and God is life. And if we attend to gratitude, we're actually entering into to life more deeply. Yeah. To say thank you to a person but then especially to God. To say thank you to a person or to God is to care for your spirit. It's to, it's to attend to that, to that weighty thing that, that just, ooh, it comes. 
Now, um, here's the thing. To try to attend to any of these things that we've been talking about, it'll have spillover effects in the other areas. We, we've kind of mentioned that, you know? Attend to your body. Oh, man, your soul and your spirit will become more whole. Attend to your spirit. Become a, gra- a gracious person, and your soul will change. It, Becoming a gracious person will cause you to let go of cynicism. Like bitterness in the soul and cynicism in the heart, it will go away. Why? You attended to your spirit and your soul got healthy. You know? This is really, really important. Um, this is why, for instance, uh, during worship, it's, it's important to engage our bodies. And that sometimes when we engage our bodies in worship, it'll change how we feel. So, for instance, oftentimes in worship, I don't feel like putting my hands up, but if I'll put my hands up, I feel something new. Yeah, that's a metaphor for your whole life. Just put your hand up, you know? Move one thing and see if something else doesn't change. Yeah. Now, as we think about this and think about wholeness and we think about your body, your soul, and your spirit, uh, here's something that's really important, and it's the idea of invitation. Because some of you have been listening to me, and it, it may be mildly compelling for you, but even now, you're almost overburdened with the sense of, crap, i got a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, i got to go to the gym, and i got to start reading books, and i got to go see some art, and i got to, like, have feelings, and i got to be thankful, and crap, I can't get all this done. The kids just want dinner, and I don't like my husband, you know, or whatever, you know. <laughs> And so it feels like a long list. Some of, I know this is how it works. Some of us in the room are like, yeah, this is cool, but this is just another list, and I'm never going to get it done because I don't even do the list that I already have, you know? Mm. Okay, let me, just, let me just unplug from all of that, like heaviness and guilt or whatever that is. Um, and it's the idea of invitation. Uh, you can read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and one of the things you will never see is you will never see Jesus making anyone do anything. Jesus never makes anyone do anything. Jesus only invites. Okay, there's two amazing things in the New Testament as it relates to this. Jesus only invites people, and anytime Jesus is invited, he always goes. Just go, just take a cursory walk through the scripture. Okay, These are, that's amazing and astounding facts. What does this mean? Uh, this means that if you provide a little space for yourself, you will probably become awake or aware to the thing that Jesus is inviting you into. Okay? And here's what I've found. God is usually working in one area of our life, and the devil is trying to work, make us work on our whole life. Okay? So when you leave here, when you leave here, If the devil can't keep you from doing something good, he'll try to get you to do all the good things. My dad used to say, the devil drives, but the Lord leads. It's a good word, right? The devil pushes, but the Lord invites. It's different. And so one good response to some of the things we've been talking about this morning would be the sense of invitation. You know, if Jesus invited Peter, James, and John to get out of the boat and follow him, He asked them to do one thing. It was a big thing, but it was one thing, right? Just follow me. Let's see what happens next. Uh, Jesus didn't say, you know, quit fishing, become an apostle, learn the Bible, become a theologian, learn how to preach, lead people, become a better leader, uh, run the church, count the money. Nope, he just said, follow me, right? Yeah. So here's what I know. I know that if you will just even spend a moment, the Spirit will, will begin to highlight by the way of invitation, the, thing, the next thing that God would like you to follow him in. You know? And for some of us here, that might be, well, I would like you to follow me in trusting me with your body in any way. And some of you, you know, the Lord is saying, oh, I would really like for you to take a season and engage beauty. And some of you, uh, God is saying, I would just love it if you would work with me in gratitude, do some gratitude work, right? Or maybe even like really specific. You know, some of you might get an invitation like, why don't you take some cooking classes? You know, I mean, it could, be, it could be any number of these things, right? Listen for the invitation. 
Pressure, is, it's just never Jesus. Invitation is always him. And by the way, here's another test for knowing if something is from God or not. If you can say no, it's from God. You know, the idea of, oh, you know, an offer you can't refuse? An offer you can't refuse is the mob, right? An <laughs> offer you can't refuse is the devil. Yeah. An offer you can refuse is Jesus. Mm. This is how it works. Are we good? Okay. Hey, part one. I haven't ruined your Saturday, have I? Okay, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Go pee, get some coffee, have a banana, um, talk, mingle. And then we'll be back.